we're going to talk today about a particular aspect of corporate executive duties, um, and that is the duties that apply to uh, us as lawyers. And I want to talk both about in-house counsel and an outside counsel um, and focus on the changes that were made in the rules of legal ethics um, as a result of, of Sarbanes-Oxley. Um, the law has long recognized certain professions as what we refer to as gatekeepers. And, and the idea uh, behind a, a gatekeeper uh, is that the, um, uh, it's a professional who is situated so that the issuer um, can't do certain things without the consent or approval of, uh, of the issuer, uh, or rather of the gatekeeper. An example, the most obvious example of this would be the outside auditor. Um, the issuer can't file its Form 10-K without audited financial statements, and they have to have the letter from the auditor in there. Um, and if the auditor refuses to give the letter, then the issuer basically can't comply with its uh, legal obligations. Um, underwriters are another good example when, when issuers want to raise funds in the capital markets. They typically uh, rely on an underwriter. Um, and if the underwriter is unwilling to cooperate with the issuer, uh, then again, the issuer is precluded uh, from uh, affecting uh, raising capital or what have you. There was a long-standing debate about whether or not lawyers uh, should be um, included uh, in the uh, group of uh, professionals that are regarded as gatekeepers. Um, UCLA law professor Sung Wee Kim, my colleague, uh, who some of you may have had for classes, uh, has written a lot of law review articles on this subject um, and done it very well and has been a, you know, a real player in this area. Um, and oh, by the way, did you see that um, uh, as of today, the U.S. news ratings are out, and um, UCLA is ranked number eight in the country uh, for corporate and securities law. Um, so we were very pleased about that. Anyway, um, as as Professor Kim uh, recounts in her in her scholarship, lawyers for a long time resisted the idea that they had any sort of a gatekeeping function. Um, the idea basically was that uh, as lawyers, we're advocates and indeed uh, zealous advocates uh, for our client. Uh, the difficulty of that, of course, is that that's really talking about our role as litigators. Uh, when we think about the role of transactional lawyers, what, what we as, as, as transactional lawyers do is, is much closer. Uh, in some respects to, to uh, uh, a gatekeeping function. Um, but at the same time, uh, the attorney-client relationship and the, the auditor-client relationship do differ um, in, in very important ways. Um, the auditors, their profession, views their responsibility as ultimately being to the shareholders of the company. Uh, that their function is to protect the interests of the shareholders and make sure that the company's um, financial statements uh, give the shareholders a fair picture uh, in accordance with GAAP of the company's financial condition, the company's uh, results of operations, and so on. And the auditor, um, certainly since Servings Oxley, but even, even in many cases before that, um, the auditor is hired, fired, and evaluated, uh, not by management, uh, but by the independent audit committee. And, and so the auditor <clears throat> uh, doesn't have uh, a close uh, relationship, uh, or at least not as close a relationship, with management um, as the attorneys do. Um, Attorneys technically are responsible to the organization. 
uh, the rules of legal ethics, both state legal ethics codes and the SEC's rules, uh, say that the uh, an attorney for a corporation, their client is the entity, not the board of directors, not management. But attorneys are generally hired, fired, evaluated by management, in particular the CEO and the general counsel. And we work much more closely with management in a much more um, collegial relationship. Our relationship with management is not adversarial uh, in the way that um, uh, uh, the auditor relationship uh, certainly has some um, adversarial aspects. And so lawyers often closely identify uh, with uh, the management of the company uh, in ways that auditors or underwriters or, or some of the other gatekeepers uh, simply don't. And that's unfortunate because as we talked about uh, from the outset of the semester, uh, all of the functions of the board of directors, whether it be monitoring, or management uh, or service, but certainly the monitoring function uh, requires that the board have good information. And the problem, of course, is that uh, the top management team, and in particular the CEO, acts as a sort of choke point uh, that they can prevent uh, management from getting. Uh, or rather, they can prevent the board of directors uh, from getting full access to information. They can control what information gets to the board, when and in what form. And for the board, that creates a significant information asymmetry. Uh, the board always knows less than the monitor, than the, than the managers uh, that it's supposed to be monitoring. 